Wow, part 13 of Let's Consider Luke. I say wow because, to be honest, the first time uh, that I went through Luke and I made my notes and everything, I really didn't think that it would have to go this long. I mean, I, I you know, I thought I could point out some inconsistencies, some oddities, maybe talk about a few points that were weird, maybe geographically, and so on and so forth. But what happened was, every time I would go back over, you know, the material just to review to do one of these, I would find so much more that was troubling. And it it hasn't stopped as I've gone, and now I'm just, I'm nearing the last few chapters. So... It, we're close to the end, but we are getting to that point, like what I guess what most people call like the passion. So it, the the time frame of uh, the Passover and the resurrection, and that's going to be loaded with some interesting material. And, and then, of course, I'm going to have to do a certain amount of uh, comparison to the law and the prophets, you know, and all that. So... This, though, is a, a noteworthy event where I'm starting. It's going to be Luke 19. And, oh, by the way, um, looking at my desktop here, I am I'm really close to being done designing a new logo, which is not that much different. It's a lot like the, the Obrey Project, you know, logo that I've used for a long time. Um, it's similar. But I think it's a little nicer, and um, I decided to, to design a new one because, for one thing, um, I'm going to be making my presentations as uh, visual and audio, so I thought a new logo would be good. It's taking a long time because I, I have, um, I designed all of it in a vector program I use. I use Infinity. Um, photo and designer. Designer's the vector, so everything's compared to Adobe products. So I would have to say well, it's like compared to Illustrator, but it's just, it's vector design. I'm just uh, having trouble right now because I feel like all of those different effects that you can put on a logo, whether it's the lettering or, or parts of a logo, I, I just feel like all of them are really old hat. And the way I look at it, I either want to keep it extremely plain with, you know, like plain line art, plain colors, honestly. Uh, because for one thing, it transfers from environment to environment really easily, you know. And if you use it like I do, I use it as, as like a little ghost image in a lot of the posts I make and other things. It's really easy to do that. If if you have like bevels and, uh, and outer glows and all of that, they don't transfer as well, you know, when you use them as those ghost images and everything. So I haven't decided yet. It's going to be some time. And that's that's why I haven't um, started up the, the Facebook group either. I just kind of want to do, you know, get get all of my ducks in a row, you know, then do it. But... um. Yeah, so hopefully no more cracked concrete. Uh, it'll be a little bit different. It'll be fresh. So, let's see. Starting in Luke 19. Kind of weird. Okay, Luke 19. He actually, he's come into, I guess he supposedly comes into Jericho. Now, and, and there's an account in Luke only. Uh, 19, 1 through 10, it's the account of this uh, Zacchaeus, okay? And he's called, uh, it, it, it doesn't, this Zacchaeus situation doesn't appear in any of the other Gospels. And Zacchaeus is called the chief tax collector. And according to the, the, the narrative in Luke, it says that Jesus was, he was coming into Jericho. And that this Zacchaeus wanted to see him, but he was short. And so he climbs up in a tree. Now in Luke, Luke has a number of terms that are only found in Luke. Uh, there's a lot of them too, actually. 
One of them is the tree that Luke says that he climbed. Um, he actually uses a, a Greek word. If you look at just the phonetics of it, it's really simple to see what tree inherited that name. The, the tree is in Greek. It's uh, Sukumorea. And um, I mean, yeah, it sounds obviously like what? Sycamore, right? Well, the weird thing is you, you can find a similar tree name in other Gospels. It goes by Suke. Now, what's... Here's... I'm going to tell you some weird things about all this, all right? The first thing is before the big con of 48, where they took that, that little land of Palestine and decided to make it look like to the whole world that it was this the land of Canaan, which is um, far beyond insane. When you start considering population sizes, uh, city sizes, numbers of cities. It, it's just so far beyond insane, it's not even... Anyways, so before they, they uh, decided to do that, the first off, the amount of, of trees that could even offer a decent amount of shade were very few. A lot of the trees that grow there that are, let's just say, trees that are worth, uh, or worthy to be climbed, there's not a lot, and they're mostly um, trees that tend to have a, a, a large horizontal as opposed to a vertical, like a horizontal spread to them. Which that's, I mean, a tree that has good horizontal branches is good for climbing. You know, you can grab onto them low to the ground and get up in them. When I was a kid, I used to climb trees every chance I got. I loved, loved, loved climbing trees. I loved climbing trees. And I didn't know much about trees, so I would climb any kind of tree. And I would climb pine trees, and I would get that, you know, thick sap on my hands and on my clothes and it was awful um, because if you get that thick sap one of the ways that you can get rid of that is uh, if you if you use a good um, pine turpentine it will take that off um, but the thing is why would Luke use that that word sycamorea um, it's not it's not even a mystery what he was uh, transliterating, sycamore. The funny thing about sycamores, okay, so you can find, if you, if you do like a Google search, you'll find there's a large sycamore tree that, that they have planted in Jericho. I don't know that it existed there before the Khan of 48. Um, and I'm I'm sure that that's probably one of the stops where they would bring tourists and they'd show them, here's a large sycamore tree like Zacchaeus climbed in Luke chapter 19. You know, it's a big deal. Go and see that big sycamore tree. But there's they're not all over the place. And in fact, here's the thing. With trees, or with forests, or with woods, wooded areas, and all that in Palestine. If you look into it, so what they did um, uh, upon initiating the Khan of 48, not only were they working overtime to try to create some sort of a, an agrarian kind of feel, uh, infrastructure to the place to make it look like a nation, to make it look like the Jews were making the deserts bloom, so, you know. Um, they also engineered uh, projects in which they were planting these forests. And now they did this in the south, the area of the Negev, where they planted this. And that, you know, that was even supposed to serve as more of a sign and wonder. Um, you know, look, they, they have the, you know, everything's blooming in this place. It's blooming, it's beautiful. They don't really tell us so much in the West about the natural fires. Um, we do know about that if we read the old books of like guys who were traveling in Palestine back in the 1800s. 
a lot of people from Britain and America were traveling in Palestine in the 1800s, mostly because they said it was mostly for surveying, but there was actually a, a, a dedicated survey that was sent over there in the 1800s too. I'm, I have a lot of suspicions about all of the other expeditions that were there in Palestine in the 1800s. As far as were they just exploring or were there a lot of projects, let's just say, that were going on there at that time. But, um, all right, one, one, uh, one account I remember reading, the guy said, um, he, that he had to be really careful because he smoked. And I think he smoked a pipe. And he said he had to be really careful about his pipe. Like he couldn't, he had to be careful about the ashes from his pipe. Like he had to keep really close watch of them because he said like the Bedouins that he was with, it was a crime. If you started a wildfire there, cause the place is so dry. Everything is so dry that if you were responsible for starting a wildfire there, they would kill you. They, they had every right, uh, based on their laws, to kill you on the spot if they knew that you had started a fire because they're so easy to start. They are. It's super dry. And so what happens is these, these even these woods and trees and forests, if they want to call them that, that they, they plant, and they plant, a lot of them are pine. And I'm sure that there's a reason for that. Maybe it's because of how easy uh, pine can be to plant. Maybe they thrive, uh, you know, without a, a ton of care. I'm not sure. But they have. They planted a lot of, like, evergreens, right? Um, and those are... <laughs> those trees get really, really, really dry, too, which is crazy. Um, and uh, what will happen is a, a wildfire will start from just about anything over there. I mean, if, if you think hot thoughts there, you could start a fire. And it'll burn like these huge plantations of trees that they've planted there to try to make the place look like they're making the desert bloom. They burn it all down. And, um, you know, there are naturalists that, that advise them, you know, don't, don't try to replant these. You know, you need to leave this alone. But they don't listen, because if, if they listened and they left it alone and they, they let Palestine kind of return to the natural state that it was created in, that it, it has existed in for, you know, the longest time, well, then it wouldn't look to the world like they were making the deserts bloom. So, funny thing. All right, now, I am sorry, but I don't know a ton about classification of trees, you know. Maybe an arborist would hear this and they could set me straight, but they'll t All right, so they'll tell you that the fig tree, they will tell you the fig tree is a uh, a type of sycamore. I've looked at the leaves. The leaves on the fig tree look nothing like the leaves on a typical sycamore. Um and I would think that that's a big clue. Um, I, they don't look anything alike either. Um, the fruit-bearing aspect of them, of course, is very different. And maybe the reason that they, they tell us that is because they have to deal with things like, you know, Luke <laughs> saying that this Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore. And, and um, we, we've got this suke which is translated in the New Testament as um, a fig tree. In the Old Testament, it's a different word. And that's a, a, a different story. Uh, so interesting things about sycamore. Yeah, you can find sycamores in a lot of places because they've, you know, they've been transplanted. You can take a tree from almost anywhere and transplant it to almost anywhere. But where they tend to thrive, their sort of natural environment, where they're said to be native to, is the eastern United States and Canada, for the most part, sycamores. Um, now, what's further interesting is the fact that this, uh, what they translate as fig tree, 
in Greek, they're calling it a souké, and I want to talk a little bit about that. So, sometimes you might find um, the idea of a um, the the a sugar maple, or a, you know, that you would get syrup from, uh, being associated with the sycamore and and sugar. Um, and I, I can't remember what it's called, but it, it has a name to it. Um, oddly enough, this tree, he's, he's calling it suke. What's interesting about it is that the, just the word, uh, zucker in German, it means sugar. And this tree is called suke, sugar. Yes, there is uh, sugar in figs. There's sugar in a lot of things. But if this tree is specifically a sugar tree, it would be more likely probably a maple, a sugar maple. Again, heavily uh, found in the eastern United States. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, furthermore, with Zacchaeus, it's a little weird because... Um, well, he's said to be chief tax collector. It's that word we talked about a few epi uh, episodes ago, Talon. In, in this, he's called uh, an Archie Talon. Now, I don't want to go too much into that again, the idea of what, what a Talon could be or could not be. But let's just say he's a tax collector. I found it weird because, well, first off, <clears throat> it doesn't say for who. Um, and this is what gets me. So later on in this, we're going to see the account of the, like, the scribes and Pharisees asking Jesus about paying tribute to Caesar, right? The words that are used in both Luke's account and Matthew's account are nothing like this Talon word that we see as a tax collector, which I would expect to see something like that, honestly. But it's a, it's nothing like that. And it, in my mind, it, it brings up a lot of questions. Uh, one of them is, well, if if these guys like um, Matthew, uh, this Zacchaeus, and maybe one one other, I'm I'm trying to think of, or two others. Why were they treated as such enemies if they were collecting taxes for the government, uh, the, you know, the sub-government of Judah, um, unless they were just dishonest, if they were known as being dishonest? Or if the, the government of Judah was so unrighteous that a tax collector for that government would be seen as a crook? Maybe. If they were collecting taxes or tributes for a foreign government, they would naturally be seen as a traitor. And and I would uh I would have to be sympathetic with that view of them. So we're having a hard time here. We don't know if this Zacchaeus is is someone who is collecting taxes for the the government of, of Judah. And I'm sure, I mean, based on all of the details, it was a corrupt government. Or if they're collecting taxes or tributes for the foreign occupying government. Because you want to know. It, it has a lot to do with interactions with people and the implications of that. So we're not told. And, you know, if... if if it could be found out, it's going to take a lot more time to look into that and explain it. The weird thing is, um, so when Jesus comes into his house, what he does is he's, he, the one statement the guy makes to him is like a justification of what, like what he does. He tells him it's, uh, Sorry, yeah, it's in Luke 19. Um, he says to him, uh, let's see. 
When they saw it, they murmured, oh, he's going to be a guest of a man that's a sinner. Okay. Well, he obviously wasn't in high esteem, was he? It says, uh, to Luke 19, 8, Zacchaeus stood and said, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Um... That's interesting. Well, it, that's interesting. There's a point of law where actually if you're found to steal and destroy something that's um, it's sure and it's translated as a bull, you're told to restore four she, which uh, appears to be a male sheep, in fact. I, I just think that's interesting that he says he restores fourfold. So... He's justifying what he does. He's not addressing what he is, this uh, Architalon. He's, he's trying to say, well, this is what I do. And the odd thing is Jesus' response to him doesn't, again, have anything with what to do with what he does for a living. It's like, well, I, you know, whatever it is, and it says he's a chief, the Archie is like chief. He's like a chief tax collector. Um, in this account, Jesus is not addressing what he does for a living. And, you know, that's, that's integrity, what you do for a living. The people who think that they can go out and do this, uh, a scumbag profession that's lucrative, um, wherein the things that they do and the ways that they profit themselves is a harm to others and think that they can then go to church on Sunday and praise them some Jesus and everything is good, they're out of their minds. So I'm not sure why his profession isn't addressed here. That, to me, is even more troubling. If his profession isn't addressed, was it not that important what he did? Because it sounds like it's important. I'd like to know in what way. But it's, again, I, it's not addressed. In Luke's account, it says that all Jesus said to him is, This day is salvation come to this house. I'm not sure in what way, though. Because salvation, I've told you this. When we see salvation throughout the Law and the Prophets, it's a, it's a real here and now saving in some way. Did he say... Did he save him in when he came to his house? He's using the 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 root they say you know sozo uh in in here it's sotero um for and and he goes on for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. That statement I didn't really get because Ishmael was a son of Abraham. Uh, Keturah's sons were sons of Abraham. I thought that there was a distinction, a clear distinction, in the sons of Abraham, like Paul made in Galatians, right? There, There is, like was made uh, throughout the Old Testament, there's quite a marked distinction. I don't know why just the son of Abraham would be used. It, it's very important the two more modifiers one would use when they're distinguishing Israel and who the covenants are to. It's not just, I'm a son of Abraham. I am a son of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Esau is a son of Abraham. He is. So it's really important that we see which we're talking about. It can't, it's not just Abraham. It's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So that confuses me. And then the last statement, for the Son of Man come, has come to seek and, and save what is lost. And people can say, well, you know, he effected a, a redemption in Zacchaeus. That would be good. I would like to know in what way, because Zacchaeus in verse 8, justified. It sounds like he justified himself, even though he's the chief tax collector, he does all of this good, and it's not addressed here. And so, in that way, 
I get confused. Now what's even more strange is directly after this in Luke it said that he tells that parable of the uh, the ten minas wherein and I've heard many comments on this he tells the last servant that didn't make anything of his money that he should have put it in a bank and at least it would have gained through usury and I I I've lost count of how many people that believe in in the uh, the divinity of Luke's account have tried to make sense of this because you know usury is unlawful it's against the law so him telling this story in which the the righteous lord depending on how you you know place what symbols where um validates usury i know i know i'm not looking at it right there's something uh if i would read into the text harder uh i would see the the sense to it but you know before i looked at luke this way i have read luke these parables these sections um an innumerable amount of times okay and usually what happens is when you've got it in your head that it is inspired and that it's good and and efficacious you you come to parts like that and you kind of have to just glaze over your mind and uh, and and accept there's things there that i just i can't comprehend but i can't question that it's divine why why can't you question because this was in a collection of books that somebody told you was all inspired people the people who told you this that put it in the collection of 66 66 books who have been controlling uh, language, changing language, controlling and changing our history on us in very significant ways. They told you that this was inspired, even though it contradicts the other uh, gospel accounts. You have to believe it. And that's why you have to glaze over these things when you get to them, because they just don't jive. Now, I'm going to go right... I, I'm not going to spend time in that parable of the Minas. There's not a lot in there, really, I can extract from it, other than how bizarre it is um, that he advised that 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 servant to... Uh, to put his money in the bank. He could have put my money in the bank and it would have gained some usury. Uh, Luke 19.23 Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. <laughs> not, not good. Um, so there's some interesting things about the triumphal entry part of Luke 19. Uh, one of them is, well, there's a few things, and I'm just going to, I'm going to let some of these just fly, because they're weird, right? The first thing is, this is, um, in both Luke and Matthew, he basically tells his disciples, he says, uh, what I want you to do, let me see if I can, get it right at the the point here i'm sorry um oh <laughs> i'm not looking at the red letters i'm looking at the black ones okay so in 1930 it says go ye into the village over against you uh in the witch at your entering good night man who can read this stuff let's try this Go your way into the village on the other side, in which, as you enter, 
you will find a colt tied, which no man has ever sat upon. Untie it. How would they know by sight that no man had ever sat upon it? <laughs> just... Okay, well, it was a detail. Sorry, he's just throwing in a detail. He says, untie it and bring it. And if anyone shoots at you for stealing their colt, <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says, if anyone asks you why you're untying it, <laughs> because the owner of it might be curious. He might want to know why these strangers are untying his colt. <laughs> if anyone takes a notion as to why you're just taking an animal that's not yours, you just tell them the Lord needs it. <laughs> Jeez. That actually works pretty well, you'll find. Um, and I'm sorry, but I, I have to say it. Hey, you know, if you were a, a competent con man and you just went to some city full of, of churches and went to take something of theirs, and they said, you know, why don't that's mine? What are you doing taking it? What's well, mine? If they're nice and they don't shoot at you for taking their... Have you, any of you ever heard about like the punishment of horse thieves back when? It's a big deal. It's a real big deal. Oh, it's a colt. It's not a horse. Yeah, it's still, it's still an animal of value. Donkeys are very valuable animals. Um, especially if you, if you raise livestock, they're really, really good for, uh, putting out with your livestock because they'll keep a lot of predators away. Um, they're good beasts of burden. So they're valuable animal too. And, uh, you know, you're just going to take somebody's animal and they would have every right actually to, to shoot at you or to try to harm you, to stop you, whatever. But you're just going to say, the Lord needs it. I would be, if I was one of the, um, you know, here I am, I guess, I'm being terribly irreverent right now. Am I? The problem with this is, you know, I don't want to be irreverent about things that, let's just say they are things that I don't understand. There's no need to be irreverent about something that you're too, uh, ignorant or or misinformed about and and i I do hear a lot of people that that they become very irreverent and um um well I guess I'll just use the word blasphemous it, slanderous about some things that i I just don't think they're fully informed on you know before they adopt that attitude. But I do have to look at this. I do have to look at this in a in an objective way, you know, without sitting here being worried that I'm going to be struck by lightning if I say these things. If I were a disciple, and you, you have to keep in mind now, they keep telling us in these accounts that the disciples weren't really aware of who he was. Now they, they yeah, they figured him a prophet and. Um, they seen him do a lot of great things. That's quite true. And if he sent them to do something, whether they understood it or not, I could I could honestly see them. Okay, right, we'll go do that. We don't have to understand it. I, okay. He is telling them to go and take something which isn't theirs. Uh huh. I would be a little, I might be a little uh, hesitant. I might be a little questiony. Like, um, does it belong to somebody? Yeah, I might ask that. Does it belong? Is it nobody's? Will I find it? Because he says you're going to find it tied. He didn't say you're going to find it wandering. If you find an animal tied somewhere, it belongs to somebody. He didn't tell him to go find the person it belongs to first. He says, go and untie it. Hey, if somebody catches you and asks you, what are you doing? You tell them the Lord needs it. That's right. That's what you tell them. 
no matter what it is, and tell them the Lord needs it. I'm I'm a little uncomfortable with this because I'm not seeing enough details that are putting my mind to ease. Because we are looking at something that technically is theft. And theft is, uh, of course, one of the Ten Commandments covers, you know, thou shalt not steal. And another one covers, you shall not covet. I know that sounds very irreverent, but let's just be objective for a minute. The other odd thing is... Uh, in Matthew, it's not... Uh, so here, this cult is uh, this Greek word, polos. But in Matthew, it's not quite the same. We do also see polos, okay? Um, but in, in Matthew 21, 2, um, he doesn't tell him you'll find a polos. He says, you'll find an onos, which they translate as ass, and a polos, which is supposed to be the foal of an ass. Maybe it came full, maybe it's supposed to come from this pole, okay? Um, and what's weird is actually in Matthew it says he's writing both the Onos and Polos. I kid you not. I don't know how you ride the two of them unless they were both pulling something that he was writing. You know, it's, it's just weird, man. Um, and then the prophecy, I'm, I am, I'm rabbit trailing into Matthew. The prophecy that they mention in Matthew, I can't find anywhere. Not in Luke, not in the prophets. Uh, nowhere. Now, in Luke 37, it says that, um, as he was now getting near at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the, uh, the Pharisees, the multitude, they said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said, if I, if I told them not to speak, the stones would cry out. Um... I'm, I, I don't know that that's reflected in Matthew at all. The stones crying out. Uh. Huh. Nope. It's only in Luke. Stones crying out. Okay. So the, here's something kind of weird that I wrote down about this. Uh, he's supposed to be in, in verse 37, it says, um, and maybe it was in Matthew that he says he's looking over Jerusalem because it says this, like in 1941, it says when he came near and he saw the city, he wept over it. Um, but here's the problem with this, just on a topological and geographical point of view. If back here in 37, he was at the peak of the Mount of Olives, and he's looking over Jerusalem, so now he's, he's going to be coming towards Jerusalem. I've got Google Earth up. I'm going to kind of show you a little bit. I'm going to tip, tip it down. On the right here is the Mount of Olives. On the left over here is the Temple Mount. This is Jerusalem. So the Jerusalem and Palestine is actually far lower in elevation than just the Mount of Olives. If I draw a measuring line and you stay to the, the face of the earth from the uh, summit of... And it's not a mountain. It's a freaking hill. It's a little bump. It's a hill. Jerusalem's not on a mountain either in Palestine. Okay, It's a little flat hill. These aren't mountains. These are not mountains. They are hilly, uneven ground. So if you, uh, if you draw a line and it sticks to the ground, all the way to the Temple Mount, it's not even a half mile. That's not a straight line in the air, so it's even less than that. Okay? Very close. So there's a couple of problems. 
One is in 37, it says that he is, as he came near to the ascent, so he'd have to be at the top, right? And then in 41, it says, and as he came near, he saw the city and wept over it. All right, well, the thing is, if you're if you're leaving the summit and you're traveling near to the city, you're just getting lower and lower and lower and lower. Um, it, it, you you don't have much time to see it and weep over it. You got a little bit here. Um, but by the time you're near the city, I guess we would have to say from this uh, this little ditch here that they often try to um, uh, convince us is, uh, uh, well, various. There's one river. It's uh, Kidron. It's actually a Nahal. It's, uh, they just translate it as brook by Jerusalem. Uh, anyways, as he would get near, the city would be pretty far above him. And uh, if the old walls, like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Ottoman, the still old walls, uh, were there, he would just be looking up at it. And this thing they call the Temple Mount is even further up in the air and all of that. So he would have to really do that from the peak of this mountain, not as he got near. Because uh, all he has to do is go just a a little bit here, man. This is like not even a half mile from here to here. Okay. So if he travels a minute, he's already not overlooking the city so much. That's one thing. The other thing is, guys, look, we're told all these stories in the Bible that, um, you know, this, this force and that force and the other force uh, besiege Jerusalem and all that. Well, look, the old city of Jerusalem is literally these, you can trace these old walls, okay? Very small. Remember, Mark Twain said a guy who walked fast could go outside the wall and get all the way around the city in a day. Or no, not, not a day. I'm s Not a day. I'm sorry. He said a guy who walked fast could get all the way around the city in like an hour or so. That's no joke. I know people who walk, just regularly walk, and they can walk like a good size radius in an hour. Okay, so it's not out of hand for him to say the old city, which were the old walls, that's what, what was standing before they built all of this crap from the 48 con forward. They built tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of this crap. They have four major pipelines that they brought into this place from elsewhere because there's not enough water to sustain people. There's barely enough water to sustain the few inhabitants it had when Twain visited. And the other thing that you have to consider is all of these hills, the one they call Olives, this one here to the south, Okay, this hill over here to the east, these are not, these are outside of the old city walls. This hill up to the north, all of them surrounding what they tell us is uh, Jerusalem, they're all higher in elevation. Any old army could just bring in their engines and their, if you really want to believe that all of, all they used were like trebuchets and catapults and all of that, you know, whatever they could still bring them in out of range and just pummel the city with fire, with stones, with anything. It, it, we're not talking about a contest. Okay? As, as far as defensive, this location here, guys, it's shit. Um, so there's that. And going further, um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, right there at the end, like uh, 1944, he makes a statement, which is kind of almost um, just a weird, bizarre blend of the Jerusalem, Jerusalem statement, which he makes in Matthew and Mark, but later on when he's already in Jerusalem. Now, in Luke 20, by this time he's he's uh he's entered Jerusalem. Um the chain of events they are really different than Matthew. Surprise, surprise. What's weird is after he cleanses the temple in Matthew, it says that he went back and he was staying at Bethany. And then he had come back 
to further teach in the temple, and that's where he has the run in with the Pharisees about how is it you do all these things and by what authority? And he asked them the question about John the Baptist. Where was his baptism from? Their answer is actually different in Luke than Matthew. Surprise, surprise. Um, but uh, kind of a weird thing. So in, in Luke 20, there's the parable of the vineyard. And most people are... are Pretty familiar with that. Um, a guy, a lord, he plants a vineyard. He leases it out. And then he goes away. And um, the people that he leases, it, he, he sends servants later to get the fruit. That was, you know, I'm sure part of the agreement. And they wouldn't give it up. Now, it's a, it's a very good parable that that illustrates i think it, it illustrates a very good point um but something that's um that has really underpinned this idea of uh, what we would call replacement theology is the statement in which he says when he sends his son, and they said, oh, look, it's his son. If we kill him, then we can take, you know, we can take possession of this. Kind of two weird things. Well, one thing is that in both accounts, <clears throat> Jesus is said to have said, basically, the vineyard will be given to an ethnos. Ethnos, right? Ethnicity. This is a different people, an ethnos which will bear the fruit. So that's a big part of replacement theology because, you know, if people believe that Judah and Israel were the Jews, and he's saying that it would be a different people that would bear this fruit and so on and so forth, then they get their replacement theology and they think, well, we all are Gentiles, but, you know, we're grafted in and replacement and so on and so forth. That's where it would come from. Um, it is kind of actually a little weird, too, because the answers to this, uh, when he's telling this parable, they're so different uh, from the Pharisees in the, in the one and the other. Like, when, when he... He says here in, in Luke uh, 16, he will come and destroy these farmers and will give the vineyard to others. Um, hmm, wait a minute. There's no ethnos there. That's in Matthew. I have to jump back and forth so much between this and other Gospels. I'm just double checking it. I don't think there's any mention of the ethnos in Luke, is there? He will come and destroy these farmers, give the vineyard to others. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. Do we see ethnos? Um, no. else another and i'm sure whether whether you can find ethnos in there or not if you're big into replacement theology you would certainly latch on to the um alois as much as you would the ethnos and you would just of course use the two as complementary but like i said there are a there's a number of portions of Matthew that I'm not that comfortable with either. And I do address them from time to time. And I don't want anyone to think that, well, there are problems and there are uh, areas in Matthew in which it doesn't follow the Law and the Prophets, the rest of the Scriptures. So, of course, then the only answer to that can be that it's all um, bunk, whatever you want to, you know, whatever label you want to put on it. 
that it's uninspired, that it has been mangled beyond recognition. I don't know. The, um, the thing about some of these issues that don't add up, and there are issues that don't add up, is that there can be multiple reasons for why they might not add up. This is one of the reasons that I spend so much of my time trying to figure out the Old Testament language, Obri, and I do spend some time in the Greek, but not nearly as much because I've seen enough evidence that tells me that what we call Koine Greek, a lot of it is based on Obri, a lot of the terminology and everything. That's the language, and it's not consistent like Obri is. It To me, it looks just like a fiat language, like English or just about any other language spoken today. So it's more important to figure out the Obri. But that's one reason why is because the languages have been changed. A lot. And one of the side effects to that is a lot of confusion and problems. Things aren't adding up. So you can't always entirely denounce things because you see uh, problems. You, you can at least point out those problems and say, "There's we have, we have some serious issues here. Um... And I, for one, if if there are most people out there that are seeking to teach these things and they won't address these serious issues, that's what I take issue with. More than the fact that these problems exist in the text, and they do, and that's that's a serious concern. But to me, a more serious concern is that so many out there seek to teach and do not grapple with these most serious inconsistencies. So anyways, in, in Luke, the Pharisees, when they said when they heard it, like when he said that he was the, the vineyard would be given to somewhere, uh, somebody else. In Luke, they seem to know exactly what he's saying. And they say to him, when the, it, the text says, when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And that's where he does the chief cornerstone thing. Well, in Matthew, what happens is he says, uh, they caught him, they cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And then when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard comes, what will he do unto these husbandmen? And they say to him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. That's a remarkably different perspective and reply from the Pharisees in Matthew as opposed to Luke. And that's significant enough to pay attention to it. The only thing I'm going to bring up concerning... Uh, Luke twenty nineteen through 26, the paying taxes to uh, Caesar, uh, is just the difference in terminology between um, Matthew and Mark, and then Luke and Paul. In Matthew, the tribute that's mentioned, because these, this passage does pretty close to parallel the passage that we'll see in Matthew 22. In Matthew, the tribute is the word kenzos, okay? And it's only found in Matthew and Mark. Um, it does appear to be a sort of forced tax. In Luke 20:22, 20, it's foros, foros. Um, it's only found in the works of Luke and Paul. And it does seem to be some kind of a forced tax, but here's the problem. These are, are completely different words, and I don't have anything other than the fact that these are supposed to be parallel accounts that tells me that this foros is a... Um, God, 
Good night, man. <sighs> is another term. We'll just say that. Is a synonym for this other word. It's an oddity. It's not the end of the discussion. It's just an oddity. And then there's the resurrection. So the, the last few verses where it's uh, whose son is the Christ and beware of the scribe, it's basically, those are, um, they're basically parallel. They're not the same as the other accounts. There's not so much to them that I would say, oh, it's horrible, you know, but it's different. Still, though, the this much of Luke does seem to follow pretty close with the events in Matthew once he gets to Jerusalem, except for the fact that they said he went back to Bethany, you know, after the kicks everybody out of the temple. Yeah. It does get it does get worse after this, of course. Why couldn't it? Couldn't be neat and simple. Um, the weird thing for me, it, it, this is found in both Luke and Matthew. It is different. The accounts are different, and this is about the resurrection. Okay. Um, in Luke. It says, uh, in Luke 20, 27, it says, Then uh, they came to him certain Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, they said, Master, Moses wrote unto us that if any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that brother should take his wife and raise up seed to his brother. That's, um, that, that is a point of law. It appears many times in the law. Um, the word is yabem. Um, and it basically has to do, it's impregnate. Your brother had a wife, he dies without any a male seed. You take his wife, you impregnate her, which yet yeah, that involves having sex. Um, you impregnate her and um, you have as much sex with her as it takes to impregnate her until she has a male heir, not a female. If she has a, a daughter, you would keep having sex with her until... Eventually, maybe she would have the male heir. And what happens is that male heir takes the name of your dead brother. So you're raising up seed in the name of your dead brother. Um, in fact, Judah's um, second born son uh, did not do this. He was supposed to do this. this. This is one of the proofs that the law existed before Sinai. Um, the oldest son of Judah married a, a girl named Tamar, and Yahweh despised his oldest son, and he killed him. <laughs> so his next son, Onan, um, he was to take her and, um, and have sex with her until she bore a male son. And I am specifically saying that because we hear... Uh, you know, we go to these church services and we hear all the time these very lofty sort of sermonizings and very polite language. And um, I think sometimes we miss what's going on here. This is really what's going on. I'm not saying it over and over again to like celebrate it. But I am saying it over and over again because that's the reality of it. Now, Onan was supposed to take Tamar and, um, and have sex with her until she conceived and brought forth a male um, which would take the name of his dead brother. This was the purpose. Um, he didn't do that. And matter of fact, what it says very clearly in the text is that he did have sex with her. She's probably good looking. I mean, that's the only way that she could have disguised herself as a harlot and got Judah to have sex with her. She was probably pretty good looking. And he thought, okay, well, yeah, I'll take her and I'll get my own gratification out of it. But I'm not going to do as the law states and give her an heir. 
to raise up for my brother, it says that he wasted his seed in the ground. So he, he was pulling out. He was not inseminating her. And by doing that, it says that he made Yahweh angry and he killed him too. This is a point of the law. This is a repetitive point of the law, that this is exactly what was to happen if a man died. Now I'll continue, because this is it's kind of a big deal, and it, uh, it relates directly to something I've been looking at now for a little while. So they keep going. They keep saying, so the second took her to wife. He died without giving her an heir, and the third took her... And and also an, uh, seven seven brothers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The first thing is that's crazy because now this woman has had sex with every single man in that family. Um. So therefore, in the resurrection, they say therefore in the resurrection, whose wife is she? Ha 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 ha. They got him with a good question. Now, I don't know if that's really a good question, but I get where they're coming from. Now, these Sadducees, and I'm not sure if uh, this comes from the Obri word Sadak, which actually, it's translated as righteous Sadak. I'm not sure if that's where it comes from. I think that's the official story. That that's where Sadducee comes from. Um, and it says that he answered them. This is what Luke says. And... Matthew's account is not all that different, the answer. Not really. There's a little bit of variations. So in Luke, it says uh, that he answered and said, The children of this world marry. I'm not reading the KJV. I, I just hate KJV language. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they can't die anymore, for they are like the angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all are alive to him. And then after this, it says that uh, they were all very impressed uh, by what he had to say. So I have some questions about this. Remember, this account is found in both, uh, both Luke and Matthew, and it's, it's very similar in both. The only like big difference is in Luke specifically, he says those who would attain to the resurrection, thus implying that not everyone would be resurrected. Now, I'll, I'll go through my notes real quick, but I might add quite a bit, because this is kind of a big issue. Um, the first thing is, uh, I still haven't found evidence for the doctrine of the resurrection in the Old Testament yet. Um, going to heaven the resurrection, any of that. I'm sorry, haven't found it. Um, and like I said, even salvation, it, it's not a spiritual thing in the Old Testament. It's, it's a very real, natural, here and now sort of thing to be saved. That doesn't mean, that does not mean that ideas like that do not exist in the text of the Old Testament. This is where we come to one of those things is, all right, well, if there's problems, like, for instance, there's a lot of doctrines in the New Testament I can't find in the Old. There's a number of them. Does that mean they don't exist? Not necessarily, because there are a number of reasons why we might not find a particular doctrine echoed in either the New from the Old or the Old from the New, and there's a lot of reasons why that could be. One reason that could be is because the books in the New Testament are not inspired. Uh, one reason could be the books of the Old Testament, or some of them, are not inspired. Another reason could be none of it is inspired. Another reason could be the language and the problems with the language. I find routinely 
for anybody who's followed and listened to, for instance, the Obrey Hours or any of the other um, works that I've done just concerning language and the problems with language, words, terminologies, is um, I'm finding every day, every day, week by week, language and terminology which does not seem to mean what we've been told it means all the time so it would not surprise me if we could find more clear ideas of what our ultimate uh, destiny is to be buried in the inorganic artificial masoretic that when we understand obri and it's this is not a quick and easy thing this is something that you know you've got one guy doing it basically at this point in time I, there are others out there that are studying it in this way using uh root patterns and word patterns and, and trying to put together these things and figure out okay well you know if if these cognates are used consistently in this sort of way then it's probably more likely that they mean something more like this than these other ways that I see them used that doesn't it's not consistent this is this is basically that's the, the basic sketch of how it works and I find terms all the time that they don't fit with the rest of their family and so they have to be re-examined. That's another reason why I have not found, that, potentially why I have not found this doctrine echoed in anywhere in the Law and the Prophets. And that's where you should find all of your doctrines. The, the basis of all of your doctrines should be in the Law and the Prophets. Why? Well, because as it states that, that Yahweh does nothing lest he first tells his prophets. We should be able to find basically every doctrine important and pertinent to us and our existence and our future and everything else in the Law and the Prophets. First, we should be able to find them. If we're finding ideas in the New Testament, we should be able to find them and confirm them in the Law and the Prophets. We should not be finding ideas in the New Testament we cannot confirm in the Law and the Prophets. That's monumentally important. Okay. I haven't found this idea yet, which is, it's utterly bizarre. I haven't found this idea yet. And then they say, now there are this, they say it's a sect, but I'll tell you something, the more and the more and the more I look into what we think were old sects of religion, the more I find that they were actually just sub races of people. I'm not kidding. Uh, if we look into, like, for instance, Bernier says uh, in the late uh, revolution of the Mughal Empire, he says that there were two main sects of Mohammedans. Now, does he say Sunni and Shia? No, he does not. He says Turks and Persians. Races. I found other uh, books that when describing the Nestorians because we've been told that the Nestorians were a religious sect like Catholic religious sect I found other books which clearly say that the Nestorians were a race of people so were, were the Sadducees a religious sect because religious sects were just they were unheard of in the Old Testament there was not, well, they believed this and they believed that. That sort of sectarian garbage arises when you confuse the language for one thing. Um, if they arise with the language not being confused, then they're just clearly idolaters, heretics, lawless people. Because if the language is clear, there's no question about why one group of people believe something different than another group those beliefs that people have denominations that we have today they're based on an interpretation of the language if you have a language that there's no question about what the things mean 
that are written and required, then you don't have, you don't even have the room for there to be different sects, different denominations. So why we're supposed to believe that there are, that's a problem. If there were, then we have to ask why there were. Because there doesn't appear to be a confusion about language by this point in time, to be honest with you, because it would appear that most of the readers of these things would have still known Obery. Denominations and sects arise from different interpretations of languages that are fiat in nature. Okay? So the fact that they're telling us that there was this sect or denomination who didn't believe that there was a resurrection is interesting. Why? Why? Now, they're telling us also that, well, that Jesus did, of course, but they didn't. And they're giving him law, okay, to back this up. He doesn't point out, when he answers them, he doesn't point out, he doesn't point out the Law and the Prophets, and that bothers me. He doesn't point out the Law and the Prophets. He tells them that, no, well, it won't be like that. When those who attain to the resurrection, and in Matthew it just says, in the resurrection, I mean, in Luke it says, those who attain unto the resurrection won't be given or taken in marriage they'll be like the angels they'll be equal to the angels not given and taken in marriage and this brings up a whole number of of problems and questions if you think about it uh, uh, would there be the the first question is this would or would there not be gender assignment in the resurrection? If you die as a man, are you not resurrected as a man? Our gender is so integral in who we are. Our gender dictates so much of how we think, how we act. My gender, the, the fact that I was made a male, is it's so intertwined just with my psyche and things I think and things I do that if I was not made into a eunuch but literally reformed into a being with no gender, I do have to wonder how different that would make me. Would it make me better? Maybe. I mean, then I wouldn't have a sex drive, which can get, can make life very complicated, our sex drive. And the reason why males uh, seek sex with females and the reason why females um, allow males to have sex with them. <laughs> um, anyways, on a serious note, but if, if all of us were made from the gender we were into a uh, some kind of a neutral gender, I think it would dramatically change who we are. Now, I'm not saying that would necessarily change us for the worse, okay? But I am pointing out, I think it would definitely change us. Um, so, if... Um, if we are in a gender still, after the resurrection, why? That's a good question. If, if we were resurrected as a gender, because he didn't say that they're genderless in the resurrection. He just said they're not given or, or taken in marriage. But he didn't say they don't have a gender. When we see angels or malak in the Old Testament, they're male. When we see angels, are, they're called agalos in the, the Greek. They're male. They have a gender. He doesn't say we wouldn't have a gender. He just says they're not given or taken in marriage. So if we do have a gender, 
Still, in the resurrection, why? For what reason? Why would we have a gender if we weren't reproducing? Now, we could go back to what I said about our gender making up much of who we are. But, still, the reason it does is because we're male or we're female. And part of being male or being female is our reproduction or the role we serve in that reproduction. You see what I'm saying? And um, I guess if... I, I have questions both ways. If the resurrection happened and, uh, and we were resurrected or whoever was resurrected, Maybe I, I wouldn't attain to it. All right, let's just say whoever was resurrected. If they were resurrected in gender, why? If they were not resurrected in gender, why? Because if, if he just compared them to the angels, the angels are shown in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, as having gender. Now, he said that they would be equal with the angels who are not given in marriage. So then is he saying they don't reproduce? We don't have, other than speculation, we don't have instances of angel re, angels reproducing. I don't, I don't know of a reason to have gender without reproduction. And I, I also don't know why if both the male and the female gender are, are good and vital, you know, like two halves in this sort of equation of, of man, why we don't see f uh, female angels? If they do have gender, why angels don't reproduce? Or we just don't see any material on them reproducing. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and the, the, the thing is with language, what is oftentimes translated as angel in the Old Testament is just this word malak. A malak could be anything. It doesn't have to be an angel. Okay, in the fourth commandment, when it says who... who who you should not make work on the Sabbath, one of it is your malake, your angel. You can't make your angels work on the Sabbath. Make sure. Don't make your angels work. Do you see the problems here? The terminology. Our lack of understanding of so many issues comes down to we don't understand the language. It frustrates me to see people teaching doctrine. They don't understand the language. They're using concordances. They're using lexicons. They're using dictionaries. They're using different translations. They don't understand the language. So it's all speculation. The blind leading the blind. That's a fact. <sighs> if he says the angels don't reproduce, how can they reproduce with men? This passage is used so much to argue. So much. People just argue, argue, argue. And again, they're not coming to any resolution because there's still people on every side. There's still people that believe that uh, Satan had sex with Eve. Well, even though Satan isn't mentioned in Genesis 3, it's, it's something called Nahash. What do you think that is? You think it's a serpent? Do you think it's a whisperer, an enchanter? Do you think it's bronze or brass? It's why people think in Genesis 6 that it was angels that came down. They had sex with women. They created giants. And it was crazy. Because it just says the sons of Aliyim. The children of Israel are called the sons of Aliyim God. There are still people that hold different beliefs. Why? Because none of them understand the language. If these... If these scholars on both sides, they really understood the language, they wouldn't be arguing like they are.
And what are we to take from Jesus' statement when he says that, uh, so in Luke's account, he says that when Moses calls Yahweh the Aliyim, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Well, in, in Matthew's account, he just says he's the God of, and he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Are we to take from that that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when they died, that their soul or spirit stayed alive? Are we to look at it in a sort of an eschatological way, that their body was dead, but they're going to be resurrected? And I'm being completely, I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic, being totally serious here. From that statement, how are we supposed to take it? There's a lot to be digested from that. These doctrines, these doctrines drive me nuts. They drive me nuts. Um, and, and people, especially the ones who just want people to believe what they believe, so that maybe they don't feel so lonely, you know, they'll, they'll take a lot of, of, um, fishy, dubious minority sort of passages and they will use them and they will twist them so that they reflect their own beliefs. It's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. It's pretty sick. Uh, you know, there are people out there that they sincerely believe that what they believe is what's right and what's best for the people around them. I understand that. Um, the problem is, don't come along and teach these things like they're settled. I, I am sorry they're not settled. I wish they were settled. But stop teaching them like they are settled. Because they're not. Um, and that's it. Like I said, I, I'm not going to go into any, anything else in Luke 20. Uh, really after this, there is, um, 21, 22, yeah, it's four chapters. Part of that has to deal with the comparison between what we call the Olivet Discourse in Matthew, uh, 24 and 25. And what we see essentially is as something similar to that here in Luke. And we've seen something similar to that before. It was really chopped up. The way it's pieced together is just ridiculous. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really going to spend any time on that or not, to be completely honest with you. I would really like to get into the specifics of the, the last night, the trial, death, resurrection, and be done with this. So, um, hopefully we're, we're looking at just a couple of more episodes of this and we'll be able to wrap it. I wish there wasn't so much that has to be questioned. I wish there wasn't so much. I really do. The last thing I want to be is the guy who has to first off see these things. You know, they, they say there's ignorance. Oh, I'm sorry. There's... <laughs> There's bliss in ignorance, and it's absolutely true. You know, if Marx calls religion the opiate of the masses, he's not lying. And there is a, a harshness to understanding that things aren't the way you were told. And it takes a while to cope with the fact that things aren't the way you were told. And after you get to a point where you're able to cope with that, uh, for me anyways, then there's the point of being a little bit upset with the people who teach these things, people we trust, who teach these things as if they are. They're just, they're... Beyond argument, they're absolute truth. We know they're absolute truth. They, they come from God. 
You know they come from God. I'm here to tell you in a test. They come from God. It's good. Uh, everything's going to be okay. We just need to love one another as the best we can. Do what we can. Love one another as best we can. And let God, he's going to sort it all out. You know, in the end, we're going to be sorted out. He's going to take care of everything. God loves everything. God loves everybody. Jesus loves everything. Jesus loves everybody. We need, just need to love uh, each other and everybody. We need to believe in that. We come to these things we don't understand. Listen, the last thing you want to do is to think too much about them, okay? Because here's a problem, okay? You can think or you can love, all right? You can take your pick. You want to think or do you want to love, all right? Now, I'm not trying to be unloving by saying that, but if you think too much, well, you know, you're not loving. The more you're thinking, the less you're loving. And we just, we want you to think about that. That sucks. I'm sick of that. I had to hear a lot of people throughout my life talk that shit talk. And then turn around and not live lives that reflected it. And if they tried to live lives that reflected it, their, their lives were a freaking mess. They were a joke. The only kind of people that can live lives that seem to reflect that are basically like pastors or other people who are completely financially supported and, and don't really have to answer to anyone of their congregants, they live those fantasy lives. And then their congregants, their dupes, they look at them like, why can't I live the fantasy life that they live? Well, it's because you don't have a few hundred people financially supporting you that you don't really have to answer to. And I'm not, I'm not blaming just the pastors, those stupid people that keep giving them money and houses and cars and everything else. With the itching ears, they love that those people bring them those honey-coated messages that don't address any of these things. So, they got it coming. I'm not somehow saying, oh, those poor people, those poor people in the pews, man, they're really just being beat up by these people. It's taking advantage of them. When's somebody going to come along and, and, and stick up for the little guy out in the pew? Well, you know what? They get what they got coming. Those people are going to shut off their brain. This isn't just with their church. This is everything. This is with government. This is with raising their kids. It's every single thing in their life. They want to shut off their responsibility to do any of those things. They want to say, well, I'll go to work. I'll go to work and I'll support my family. And that's what a good man has to do. Go to work and support his family. And if I need to, I'll sign up. I'll go in the army and I'll kill whoever they say I got to kill. Because that's what a good man does. And I got to leave all these other things up to somebody else because that, that's their job. My job is to fork over whatever they say to fork over, to shut off my brain and let them do it. If that's you, then you deserve somebody coming along and taking your money, taking whatever from you. doesn't matter what they take from you. You deserve it. You deserve it. All those people out there in the pews that are giving their money to these people and watching them live their fantasy fairy tale lives, wondering, why can't I have a life that's that spiritual? You deserve it. You deserve to be all bound up in frustration and confusion. I'm not sticking up for anyone. I am sticking up for the truth. I'd like to know what the truth is. That's why I do what I do. I want to know what the truth is. Now with that, I'm out of here. So I'll see you next time.